This is the first part of the introduction to cubicle type theory. So it all begins with passes. The first idea in cubicle type theory is to index passes by the standard interval from 0 to 1. You can think of this interval as the set of points between 0 and 1. However, it's better to think about this more abstractly because we are not able to ask where the point, say, point 3 is. It's a continuous line and the only thing you can the only points you can name are the zero and the one. So in cubicle type theory, we come up with a new way to write down this path, which is the following. Um, you're saying that I have M, which of type A, and the entire thing is indexed by the I, which is a point in the standard interval. So you are extending the syntax of the context so, so that you are able to put intervals in the context. Here, the context has the i as a point in the standard interval. So that means that entire thing is, entire thing is a line, which is exactly what's shown in the picture. So you can put in more than one interval in the context. Suppose you have two intervals then that will give you a square. Um, you can also put in more. In general, if you have n intervals in the context, then you will have n cube in the picture. Um, and that's why it's called cubicle type theory. Um, so you start with uh, uh, you start with an interval and a square and a cube and a four dimensional cube and so on. Mathematicians are not very creative in coming up with names, so they are just calling the n-dimensional cubes as n cube. Um, so why are we doing this at all? What can we do with the intervals in the context? Well, we can do the substitution. For example, if you have a square in a space, then you can substitute 1 or 0 for i or, or j. Um, so these are the four possible substitution of the 0 or 1 for the i and j. If you substitute 1 for i, then that will give you the line in the back because that is the one direction in the i dimension. Similarly, if you substitute 1 for j, then you can have the one end of the square along the j direction. So similarly, then you can have four sides. In addition to these four substitution, then you can also have the diagonal substitution, then which will give you a diagonal across the square. So if you substitute i for j, which and that means that you're identifying the dimensions i and j, and then that will give you the diagonal. <clears throat> In general, um, you have the i, the variable i as an interval, if it's declared to be a, an element um, in the interval in the context. Then you also have the 0 as endpoint in the i, and also 1 as endpoint in the standard interval. One thing I want to bring up here is that this spatial i is not a type even though it's written as a type in all the above rules. It is not even a different kind of animal in the zoo. It's an animal from the outer space. It is completely different. So don't be fooled by the syntax. It's a completely different thing. Um, depending on the kinds of cubicle type theories you are talking about, you might have, they might have put in a different kind of algebra on the interval i. So you can have, for example, uh, given two points in the standard interval, you can construct a meet of these two points to, to give you another point, uh, or the join of it, or the reverse of it. However, in, in today's lecture, I'm not going to discuss them. In the later, later on, uh, when they matter, then we are going to discuss the details of this um, new algebra on the interval more, in more details, but right now you can just ignore it. Alright, so why are we spending all the time 
to introduce this um, weird standard interval in the type theory. So the motivation of the cubicle type theory is to solve the crisis we have about the identification types. Previously, um, we are using the identification types to internalize the equality in the types we want to deal with. Um, and later on, we are adding all the extra passes into the identification types itself. For example, the univalence, the function intentionality, the loop, or other constructors from other kinds of fancy inductive types. We are adding these extra passes into the identification types. And, all, and, and we hope that by doing so, um, it will induce a new pass in the type we are trying to discuss. For example, you were, when we are adding a loop in the ID of S1, then implicitly, it's adding a loop into the circle. Um, but there's a tension in this picture that I show in this picture already. What we actually wanted to do is to modify the paths directly. So we want to modify the universe to make it univalent. We want to modify the circle directly so that it has a loop. Um, but we are not able to do it. So instead, we are changing the identification types of them. And that's the problem because identification types are not ready for this modification. And only the original types know how to deal with this, these extra passes. So in cubicle type theory, we are going to forget about the identification types. We are going to add these passes directly into the types in question. So we are going to add the univariance in the universe directly. We are going to add the loop into the circle directly without going this wrong trip um, via, the, via the identification types. But in order to do so, we need a judgmental framework to talk about these passes without the help of the identification types. And that's why we're putting the intervals in the context, because by doing so, then we can talk about these new passes. There are some technical difficulties, which we'll discuss later on, but the first idea is to, to put the intervals in the context so we can talk about the past directly. And later on, if we want to, then we can internalize these passes as identification identifications in the identification types if we want to. But that's an afterthought. It's not necessary to have identification types anymore to discuss these passes. All right, so how exactly can we discuss this pass? So then let me show you an example, which is the circle we discussed last Thursday. Um, so I'm going to show you the new set of rules defining the circle in the cubicle type theory. Again, we are, we are going to answer the five questions about the type. First of all, we say that circle is a type, uh, so this is the same. And we're also going to say that the base is a point in the circle. Um, so this is also identical. However, the next one we are, is this. The loop is uh, elements in the identification type of the circle. So this is what we don't want. We want to talk about the paths in the circle directly without using the ID. So we are not going to use this. Instead, we are going to say that there's a loop constructor. And for any point um, in the standard interval, I'm going to give a point in the circle in a continuous way. And moreover, I'm going to say that this loop is a path from base to base. To do so, I'm going to say that the zero endpoint of this loop is judgmentally equal to the base point, and similarly for the one endpoint. So by putting in these three rules, then I have a loop constructor in the circle from base to base. So that's the so these are the two constructors. And now the next question is to deal with 
um, how to use an element in a circle. Uh, so the, the one on the screen is the old rules that we want to forget about. Um, so, but then how can we have the new rule? Well, eventually, we still want something very similar. The elim S1 with a motive and with two cases, uh, and that should prove uh, the instance of the theorem at n. So the, the motive C is the theorem you want to deal with, and that is indexed by the circle. And you have an element n in the circle, so those two are the same. And we also have a proof about the base case, so that is also the same. So now it's a new thing. You want to show that you have a, you have a proof for the loop case. So in order to do so, um, you're saying that you have a proof indexed by i. So what I mean is that for any i in the standard interval, you have a proof about the case loop i. And loop i is a point uh, in the loop in that particular location, and then you have a proof for that. So your proof is indexed by i is giving you uh, a continuous proof for the loop case. And you also want to make sure that the endpoints match up which means that the zero endpoint of your proof match up with the base, sorry, sorry, match up with the proof you gave for the base case. And similarly for the one endpoint. And that's all. That's all the premises to make it work for the elimination rule. Um, so this is a bit complicated. So let me show you a picture. So we still want to have a uh, limb, and the best picture I can show you is this cloud view, uh, just like last Thursday. So you want a point in the cloud, which is we call uh, the M base. In addition, we want a loop from this M base to the M base in the cloud, and we're going to call it M loop. All right, so the M base will be in the fiber over base, or in other words, it's a C with a X substituted by base. So that's match up with the constructed base point in the circle. And the next one is a loop. So you want a proof for the loop case. So that match up with the loop constructor in the circle. And then you have two additional judgmental equalities making sure that the endpoints of your proof of the loop case matches the M base. And this is all because you're putting the two constraints on the loop constructors. Remember that when we are putting in the, the loop construct, when we are defining the loop constructor, we said that the zero endpoint and the one endpoint of the loop constructors must be base. So, uh, the two rules, the two premises in the elimination rule is just, it just, they just reflect the constraints on the loop constructors. Um, and that's why, and, and all the other things are not important. The, the, these four are the most important premises in the elimination rule. So now we have the elimination rule set up down. Um, the next one is a computation. In, again, for the base case, it's not really um, surprising at all. If the point you want to deal with is a base point, then that will give you back the proof you put in for the base. Uh, the more interesting case will be the loop constructor. If it's a loop i, then it will give you the proof for the loop as well, but then we need to do the dimensional substitution. Uh, the reason is that the loop i you are talking about is at the dimension i. However, when you are constructing the proof, uh, it's indexed maybe by a different dimension. So we need to do the dimensional substitution to make sure that the dimensions match up. And that's it. Um, those two are the computational rules for the circle. There are two additional points I want to bring up here. The first thing is 
Diagonal substitution is crucial. By diagonal substitutions, I'm talking about the substitution I for J you saw on the screen. Earlier papers on cubicle type theory do not have this, and that's why we didn't know how to do the circle in the cubicle type theory. But now the problem is solved. The other point I want to bring up is that we are actually not done yet. We need to improve the framework to even talk about past concatenation. Right now, you're not able, you're not even be able to um, concatenate the two loops together to form a, a, a double loop. So why, you might wonder why we are okay but now stuck. To answer this question, I want to review the picture that I showed you earlier. So previously, we are using the ID types to deal with the actual passes. And because of how the ID types work, uh, it automatically have the continuation reversals, etc. because of the J. Not just what ID type is. Well, right now, um, for today, we are going to drop the ID type. We want to talk about the new passes in the types you are interested in. Um, but that leads to a problem because then no one guarantees that um, the random passes we throw in will be complete with respect to continuation, reversal, and other things. Like you can just throw in some arbitrary passes and there's no way to guarantee that there will be a new passes if you just put two random passes together. Um, however, the solution to this problem is a little bit more complicated and that's why I need uh, another lecture to explain the details. For today, let's pretend that the problem has been solved. Um, so for the rest of the lecture today, I want to talk about something very important, which is the past types in the cubical type theories. You can think about these past types as function types, except that the domain is the center interval, not the type. So the picture you should have is this. So you have a type A, and there's a path in the M, there's a path M in this type from N to O. So the thing, the one thing you, you want to pay attention to here is that the type A is indexed by the I, which means that the type can be changing along the path. The type of N could be different from the type of O. So we want to have a, a new type to, to talk about all the passes between N and O, uh, and here it is. So you have a type A indexed by the I as an element in the standard interval, and then you have N uh, on the zero size of A and the O on the one side of, of A. And then we say that you have a new type path uh, that's indexed by the A, and N and O, and that is a, the new type in the in the universe, a, a, a new type, a new elements in the universe. So that's the formation. Um, the next one is how to construct an element in a path. Uh, for this, again, we're saying that well, suppose that you have an element M that is indexed by I. And the zero endpoint is N, the one endpoint is O, then you have a path. Uh, so we are going to just recycle the lambda notation here because it's really just a function, except that the domain is the center interval. Um, so that's it. We're going to use a lambda symbol to construct a path in the in the path, uh, construct the element in the path type. So that's the constructor. The next thing is about how to use um, a path. Well, the first thing is that if you have an element in the standard interval, then you can do the application, except that it's the application for the path types. Um, so the P at the P as a path at R will give you an element of type A with I substituted with R. So that's the the path at R location. 
Um, and there are two additional rules, which is say that the endpoints match up. If you have a path from n to o, the zero endpoints of that is n, and the one endpoint of that is o. So uh, the, the thing you, sh you see on the screen is an abbreviation of two rules. There are actually two rules, but I just put them together as a one single rule to uh, one single rule to save space. So there are actually two. Uh, so these three rules are the animation rule. Um, the, so the next thing is about um, the, like what will happen if you're using something constructed from lambda. So the left hand side, the one on your left hand side is saying that if you have a path and then you construct an element in the path type with lambda and then you're doing the application and that will give you back the element at the location R um, described by this M. So that's the, the beta rule and the uniqueness principle will be like this. For any element in the path type that can always be rewritten using a lambda notation. So it will be that the P will be judgmentally equal to lambda I dot P and I. So if you review the rules for the function types, they are really just the same, except that, first of all, the domain is the standard interval. And secondly, uh, the path type also write down the endpoints. Um, so these are the rules for the for the path types. Again, I'm going to pretend that we fix the problem of the path concatenation and so on, uh, which we're going to discuss next week. Um, all right. So we have the path types, and they are internalizing the hypothetical judgment with an I in the context, and identification types are the ones freely generated by reflexivity. These two will become equivalent once we fix the framework, uh, which we will do next week. All right. So uh, from now on, I will have to be very careful because paths pass that will then now uh, be, be different from identifications. They are, they are equivalent eventually, but they are different. Um, so here are the definition. One of them is internalizing the hypothetical judgment, and the other is free, the one uh, free generated by the reflexivity. All right. Uh, so before ending this lecture, I want to show you something cool. Um, if you pay close attention to the pictures I show you, you might notice you might have noticed that um, there's no function intentionality in the new picture. And why? The reason is we can actually easily prove function extensionality in the cubical type theory. And it's not using the univariance at all. Any cubical type theory will have function extensionality. And here's why. Um, let me show you the proof. Suppose you have a P which is saying that for any uh, any point in A, I have a path from f of x to g of x. So f and g are the two functions I want to identify. And this is saying that for any point, there's a path between them. So they are pointwise equal in some sense. Um, so if I have this such p, I can just do the function application to uh, so this is just the same, except that now I'm having I'm putting the argument into the context. Um, and now, if you still remember the rule for the passes, I can then also put the argument i into the context. So you have a p of x at i, and that will give you uh, a path from f of x to g of x and they are where will be of type b of x and the next thing is the magical part 
well, it's not that magical the first time you saw it, but you gradually realize that it's actually something significant. So I'm going to just swap the order of the x of a as an argument and the i of a as the the standard interval. And then I'm going to do the lambda abstraction to give you a path. And then I'm going to do the lambda abstraction again for in the path type. Eventually, I will then have a path between f and g. So this is ridiculously simple. By the way, you still have to check the boundaries uh, of this new path so that they match up with f and g. But right now, I guess you are going to just believe me that they will work. Um, so we have a ridiculously short proof of the function extensionality. And the magic lies within this, the middle two lines that I emphasized before. There's the, the fact that we are able to exchange the hypothesis in the context leads to function intentionality in cubicle type theory. So in more details, um, the reason that it works is because both past types and function types internalize hypothetical judgments. One of them is internalizing the hypothesis involving the standard interval. And the other is, is dealing with the hypothesis in, uh, involving the uh, type. And um, both are internalizing some kind of hypothetical judgment. And you can exchange hypothesis in the context by the exchange rule. So it, it, this means that the the path type constructors and the function type constructor, which is a pi, commute. You can swap the orders of them. And that is the essence of a function intentionality. Uh, the, function intentionality the function intentionality is just saying that you can swap the order of path and function. And that's it. Um, all right. So, we have function we have function intentionality for free. Next week, we are going to fix the framework. The way to fix it is to change the definition of types. Previously, we are all uh, whenever we are defining a new type, we have to answer uh, these five questions: like what are the types, what are the constructors, how to use it, uh, what if we are using a constructor, and what are the uniqueness uniqueness principles, if any. And now we have the sixth question, which is about how to compose elements in the new type that we're defining. And we are going to call these new operators as count operators. So now every type, every single type is responsible for the past concatenation happening in itself. So we are, not, we are no longer relying on the identification types but instead, every type is responsible for the concatenation in its um, in itself. Um, all right. To just to review the picture again, uh, previously we're using the ID type to solve our problem. Now we have to be more responsible. We need to provide each time need to provide more structures to make sure that uh, it has enough passes in every type that we're defining. All right, that's all. Stay safe and stay healthy. We'll see you uh, on Thursday. Bye.